Hi everyone, um, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar titled How to Achieve One Coat, High Hiding Power Paints by Optimizing Titanium Dioxide Pigments. My name is Julie Chen Nguyen and I'm going to facilitate today. Our speaker today is Glenn Evers. Glenn uh, is a former DuPont TIO2 research scientist and inventor and is now an international TIO2 consultant he is a regular lecturer at the Western Coatings Show, and he has eight patents and has written a chapter on um, TIO2 at the Technical Association of Paper and Pulp Industry. Today, he will discuss how TIO2 particles interact with resins and paint. Okay, Glenn, um, whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Well, uh, welcome to the seminar. Um, Hariba has tried for years to get me to do this, but it took the COVID to put me in in a quarantine situation. I don't have it, and I hope you all are healthy. Um, but uh, now I have an opportunity to do a presentation. Normally, I do this in-house. I also do this in um, uh, conferences. Uh, at the Western Coatings Show, I do a TIO2 101 course, which is free, and uh, that's followed by an advanced course. And there'll be some charts out of the advanced course in here. So one of the popular questions that I have been getting um, has been, how do I make a paint coating as a very high hiding power with just one coat? So the answer to that question is dependent upon the type of titanium dioxide, how you disperse it and the dispersants. And there are a lot of variables involved, but there are certain things that you can specify to your titanium dioxide producer. Now I have worked with Chinese titanium dioxide that is a sulfate based product, which means it was made with sulfuric acid. And I've also worked with titanium dioxide made by the chloride process and particle size is very, very important. So um, I'm going to go through this presentation and um, I'm going to page down here. So while I was working at DuPont, uh, I was part of the um, creativity committee. And uh, one of the questions that we came back with was, do you wanna be able to continue and use just straight TIO2 and continue the path that you're normally at? And I'd like to share this chart, uh, which was used in our creativity courses. It was be, innovate, be innovative or be gone. So um, this, I'd like to start out with this chart because it represents the basic of what a paint is and is a metaphor for where we are going. So the old technology is a bunch of rowboats, which are particularly, we're gonna use the rowboat as a resin. And then everybody there has an ore, two ores in the water. And these are your, that's your titanium dioxide. And it is possible to reuse or use titanium dioxide in an innovative way so that you can get enhanced opacity, enhanced performance, reduced cost. And this is kind of a model. In the background, you'll see that everybody is using the ores. And this represents in the United States, we use primarily titanium dioxide that arrives as a slurry. Some of the specialty paint companies do make their own product by starting with dry. And they have a lot more flexibility in what they can do in the chemistry as a result. In the background, you'll see some sort of an orange uh, smoldering thing. That's the old technology. It's the VOCs, that's the one that's dying. And then uh, we have the new technology. And um, uh, what you see over here is some sort of mysterious red material that's coming out of the new technology. And that's surfactants. And the reason why is because the resin itself off the bow of the boat, see, it has a lot of water. And so the resin, solids had to drop in order to make the resin particle size smaller so that during the coalescence the particles will um, uh, uh, by capillary forces form a film. Now mysteriously on this TiO2 there's something called crystallites on the surface and not very many people know that almost all the titanium dioxide ever made for paint grades has an alumina surface. But alumina is not alumina is not alumina. There are two types of alumina on the surface. There's a bomide alumina and there's an amorphous alumina. And then there's ratios of those things. And then there are sizes of the crystallites that are on there. And those little crystallites are going to determine whether or not you're gonna make a one coat 
hiding product. But to take advantage of those little crystallites, you have to know something about the particle size. So I'm going to show you how to do a TiO2 optimization on low VOC paint. So we're going to talk about primarily water-based paints. I'm going to go through some titanium dioxide grades and touch on some extenders that help their performance. I'm going to talk about how to make a good dispersion. I'm going to talk about the importance of charge. And that charge is primarily determined by what is actually on the surface of the titanium dioxide. There are only two paint companies in the world that I know of that use raw titanium dioxide as their primary paint ingredient. And that means it does not have any surface treatment at all. Um, all of the other ones have a surface treatment. I'm going to go through the particle size analysis using an instrument made by Hariba, the LA950, and that is now superseded by the 960. So I've worked with that instrument quite extensively. In fact, I had one in my lab in my DuPont years uh, working in titanium dioxide. Um, it is a fantastic instrument. I was bred into that instrument. Um, and the reason why is because when I joined the company at DuPont in 1981, we had three top researchers at the Central Research, uh, uh, our, uh, Central Research Group that did nothing but particle size analysis. In fact, they had their own X-ray uh, disk centrifuge TiO2 analyzer. And through extensive testing and determining actual particle sizes versus scanning electron micrographs and testing it against the best custom instruments that we could possibly come with, we settled on Hariba. Um, this is a, a machine that I bring with me to the trade show and Hariba kindly provides me a machine that I will do a live demonstration with at the Western Coatings Conference, which is done every other year. So the next one is coming in 2021. Now at the very bottom there, you'll see the word gold standard. There is actually a gold standard. And it's kind of like going to uh, NIST and say, well, what is TiO2? What gives me the absolute best hiding power? How do I know that I have a TiO2 particle that gives me the best hiding power? We'll talk about that as we progress. Okay, so if you get a TiO2 quality certificate of analysis, they say, well, that's all I need to get the best standard. And the, the, the mantra is, if you don't ask for an analysis, you don't get it. So there are actually 33 different types of analysis that you can run on the titanium dioxide. Some have no relevance to paint making, but a lot of them do. So what are the ones that I believe you should be looking at? Items one through four show the most important contribution to particle size. I mean, to, excuse me, to hiding power. It's a particle size distribution. It's a geometric standard distribution. And what we're talking about here is the square root of the D85 um, divided by the D15. So that is the, uh, um, that is the what we'll be talking about in terms of GSD. So um, the other interesting thing is that when you get a particle size distribution curve, you want to keep an eye on the amount of particles that are greater than 0.5 micron. That primarily affects gloss. And if the particles are too big, they're not efficiently contributing to opacity. If they're too small in the 0.1 micron, they are also not efficient. So there is actually waste that you could point out and say, hey, I'm paying for a product that's not doing anything for me. I would like a, uh, some sort of compensation for that. And uh, some of the chloride processes are very good in keeping the distribution very tight. There's also some very high end sulfate grades that keep that particle size distribution tight. But how do you know? I mean, if you don't have a particle size measurement device in your lab, how do you check the quality of the products coming in? Uh, items five, six, and seven are standard things that can be provided. If you're buying slurry, they'll provide rheology data. Solids is what you're paying for. Grit is something you measure on a screen. Nibs or scats are large particles that come off a Hagman, uh, Hagman gauge process. They make a very, very thin film. And as the film gets thinner and thinner, you see the particles pop up and these are called scats or nibs. 
Okay, so let's start with the fundamental. What titanium dioxide would I recommend if you were going to make a high hiding power product? Well, in the old days, we had two grades. We had one, uh, a, it was a R900 product and um, it was evolved to an R700 product. Uh, all Everybody made it, it was a 3% coated alumina product and it was just raw TiO2. So you'll see in here that this coated product over here where it says 95% is actually a combination of, it is exactly what it says. It's 95% TiO2, but on that built into the crystal itself is something called coax alumina. And that actually rides on the surface. 50% of the soluble alumina rides uh, on the surface of the raw titanium dioxide. So there's really no such thing as titanium dioxide that's 100% pure. And then on top of that, they'll add three to 4% of alumina. And that alumina is precipitated down on the surface from water. And you find that that has the magic bomite and it has the magic amorphous alumina. Now, bomite is used for dispersion. Amorphous is used for encapsulation. So you can think of it as a blob encapsulating an M&M. Um, now you have all sorts of options. The problem with that grade is that when you move it to the outside of the house, it interacts with light. The titanium dioxide interacts with light and degrades the titanium dioxide. Now, sometimes you want that. For example, white wall tires, the old white wall tires. One of the headaches of the white wall tire was you saw this white slick that came down and went over your black rubber. That was designed purposely. And the reason why you wanted that white wall to degrade is because it cleans itself. It was a self-cleaning surface. You can go to a museum and see those little white wall, white wall slicks. So you don't want that. So if you put an alumina on that surface, you can stop that interaction of the TiO2 degrading the resin. Going down to the bottom, you can see that you can buy titanium dioxide that is 80% content. And why would you want to do that? Well, that has a fluffy silica on the surface. And the problem is, is that the more of the other materials that you put on the surface, the thicker the M&M &M coating, the worse you'll get in terms of hiding power. In a very crowded system, it's good to have some of this coating on the surface. So, we have to consider whether we are in a low PVC pigment volume concentration system or a high PVC concentration system. Up on the right, you can see the difference between a 100 and an 85. So we're talking about, and of course, hiding power is dependent upon coating thickness. Okay, so how do things hide? This is a classic curve, a classic diagram. Um, it shows titanium dioxide. The problem with titanium dioxide is that it's not white. And you say, what do you mean it's not white? It's a white pigment. There is no such thing as white. You have led your whole life believing that there is white. White only exists in the presence of light. So when you shut the lights off in your white room, what you're actually, if you could see in the dark, you would see clear crystals. And it is in fact the light that bends by refraction, diffraction, and you get some absorption of the light that comes back and bounces as it bounces off, you begin to see all the spectrum of the light and you see white. And I like to tease people by saying, what color is your teeth? And they say white. And I say, now, if you keep your mouth shut, what color is your teeth now? And they say white, and it's not right. It's not white, it's translucent at best. So unfortunately in this white, you can get very slight impurities that absorb the light represented by this blue, light blue material, this a blue light, excuse me, uh, that's absorbing into an impurity. And usually these are iron impurities, very powerful impurities are chromium. Uh, and that's just from the process that is in there and vanadium. Um, so these things are ex purposely excluded to make very pure crystals. Now this B star, B star refers to at LAB and B is how blue the product is. So if you have poor B star, it means it has a yellowish type of color. The ideal spacing of the titanium dioxide 
is a quarter micron in size. So if you can squeeze another particle in between, either a hollow one or a low refractive index particle, in this case, I choose a hydrated alumina because it's very pure, and it, it's also pure alumina, so it has complete compatibility with the surface treatment on the TiO2. You can get increased whiteness and better spacing. So this is very important. So what is a cheap way to make a pigment? Well, if you take a beer bottle and grind it to two micron, then to 850 microns, then to 144, and keep grinding this down, as you get it down to a quarter micron, it will be just unbelievably white. And so you look at that and say, well, why don't we just make paint out of ground beer glass? And the answer to that is that as the resin fills the voids where the light is, in between the particles, you go backwards and backwards and eventually you reveal the true nature of what that particle is in a matrix. And so you may have the most beautiful synthetic materials or the most beautiful mined materials that looks white and then you put it into your formulation, all of a sudden you see it kind of has a yellowish tint to it and you can't figure out why. It's because of these color impurities. So keep in mind, the beer bottle. Now, titanium dioxide is pristine white. In fact, it's so white that you could actually, if you could make a crystal out of it, you could make a wonderful diamond for an engagement. It has a higher refractive index than a diamond. So that's something to keep in mind. We don't use glass, obviously, because the silica is uh, not something that we want to be breathing either. Um, and it doesn't provide hiding power. It doesn't provide that refractive index. Now, in our journey to try and find the right resin, the right TiO2, we have to think beyond the bounds of where we are. And I will tell you right now, as of 2020, the resins are changing dramatically. The resins no longer have emulsion surfactants. The titanium dioxide no longer has a dispersant. There's reactive polymers that are going down on the surface of the titanium dioxide, and the paint is becoming a reactor. And that means that there is nothing to weep into the water. So why are we concerned about surfactants, uh, dispersants, uh, leveling agents, materials that will weep into the water? And this evolved because in California, when they were successful in getting rid of the materials that went into the air that caused smog, they then found out in order to get something that's hydrophobic, the resin itself to go into water, they had to add a massive amount of surfactants to emulsify it. And those particles in fact had to be made smaller than the titanium dioxide. So what was happening was the surfactants were getting in into the water and then somebody had the brilliant idea of taking surface water and pumping it into the aquifers. So now we have a situation that in order in particular, if you go to Los, Los Angeles, to keep the ocean from working into the aquifers as more and more people draw water from the wells, putting the surface water is not really a brilliant idea. So we have surfactants that don't have a chance to biodegrade. We have surfactants that are called forever chemicals based on fluorine that do not belong in the environment. And we are now working our way to eliminate them. So here it is. The ores have now been transferred into making a sail, as you can see here. They've also been transferred into making a foil. And uh, if you think about the, the America's Cup and you're trying to figure out what has happened to boats, this is what's happening in the paint industry. So over the next 10 years, you're going to find resins that have no surfactants, no emulsifiers. In fact, you will be able to grind dry TiO2 into the resin itself and use the polymeric properties of the resin to be able to do your dispersion. If you were at the Western Coating Conference, you would have come across four producers of cationic resins. Uh, and these require no surfactants in order to be able to disperse. And I will tell you why in a minute. So let's move on. There's an excellent paper published by DuPont Comores by Dr. Diebel and a coworker of mine in my, in my earlier days. And this paper shows that 
what we want to have the ideal hiding power is a product where the titanium dioxide is uniformly dispersed. If we have these high refractive index light bending particles uniformly distributed, on the right, we have something that we call good dispersion. Most people, as they converted to 100% water-based systems, have this in their paint coating. So the titanium dioxide manufacturers go to great pains to make a quarter micron particle size. Why a quarter micron size? Because that's half the wavelength of blue light, and that gives you the best scattering of the light. But in making the paint environmentally friendly, we essentially screw it up by building these big blobs. And you can see in these clear areas where the resin is on a poor product is that there's an opportunity for light to penetrate. Now, DuPont even went to the point of using computers to be able to find the degree of variability. And then how do you statistically determine that? So if you have a chance to go to Mike Diebold's courses, uh, you can ask them the questions that you want to be able to get this type of data. Now, I will have a side note on this. Somebody will say, hey, I want to make a white, ultra-high hiding power with this good stuff. What do I do? And the answer is this slide was made with an oil-based paint, solvent-based paint. So it just shows you what you can be. It doesn't show you what the state of the art is. Okay? So. What you need is dispersion, dispersion, dispersion. It's like real estate. In real estate, it's all about property. Where is your property? Location, location, location. So we want the best dispersible, dispersible product. We use a durable product, something that has alumina and silica on the surface to protect the TiO2 from the resin. And we don't need that for interior applications, but we do if we want to make one, one, yeah, we want one storage tank that holds everything all my titanium dioxide. There are super durable products which are used in roof coatings. We hear a lot about talking about white coatings on the surface. Now, do you need something super durable? Well, that depends on the resin. But DuPont's own data shows that the R706, a very good product by itself, and I'm very familiar with, does a very good job against super durable products. And the reason why is because it has to do with how it is dispersed opposite the other products you're trying to compare it against. So we're concerned about dispersion because we get the best possible gloss and then we dummy down the gloss with other additives like silicas and clays. The dispersion effects, the tinning strength, the contrast ratio, hiding power and whiteness. Now, the whiteness of the product is determined mostly by the impurities, but if the particle slice size is just slightly too big, it's bigger than a quarter micron, then it will begin to bend the light and you'll have kind of a yellowish characteristic to this. So what we want to avoid on exterior applications is chalking. And what happens is, is the light degrades the resin binder. It works with water and acid in the, in the environment. And in a worst case scenario, there's a raw titanium dioxide surface and the titanium dioxide can produce free radicals which attack the resin itself. So what we do is we control the particle size first to give us the hiding power. The key to keeping the light from degrading the resin is to provide sunglasses. So we need to be able to stop it, to absorb the energy, to deflect it and move it away from the rest of the resin. So it's this catch-22 in the process of absorbing and deflecting and reflecting, we wind up degrading. There are two processes. One is sulfate, which is using sulfuric acid by hydrolysis process. The other is chloride, and for, which uses oxidation, for which I got a very nice patent for making particle size. Um, there is, in the process of making the titanium dioxide, steam energy. Now, somebody asked the question, do you jet mill the product? And the answer is all commercial product is jet milled. Almost all of it is steam ground, and there are additives that are added to the steam that act as steam dispersants that help break up the titanium dioxide during the steam grinding process. For high density applications in paint, you want to have some TiO2 spacing, and fortunately, the coatings they put down on the surface help you in keeping the space, the TiO2 spaced. 
Now, for a low VOC paint, what are the properties that I would want to have to give me very good hiding power? So we need a gold standard. Now, this is a manufacturer from company number three who makes a uh, semi-durable titanium dioxide, a R706 type product, an 820, 826, 2310. This is a semi-durable, uh, uh, well, it is a durable product for exterior. And if we were just to take the slurry version of this and look at its viscosity, we would find that you can't get to very low viscosities with it by itself, even using the best commercial dispersants. The particle size distribution is slightly higher than 0.5 microns. The median particle size distribution is on target, which most manufacturers do very well. Um, when you look at do a drawdown and look at the number of particles that are actually seeing the nibs and the scats, you want a very low number of them, and, and they're not, it's not that great. And the reason why it's not that great is because this is not a, uh, I put it, I downrate it that, not because they don't manufacture it, it's because at this particular customer, the TiO2 was interacting with the resin. And how do you catch that? Well, that's where you use your Hariba analyzer to look at the interaction of the resin with the TiO2. It's kind of a neutral as to whether it's working with the uh, here type rheology modifiers. Um, and so let's move on. Gloss is not an issue if you're making a flat. Um, and then there's something called contrast ratio and tint strength. These are paint trims. But look at all these pluses you get. You can take the same pigment and make a gold standard. In fact, you could keep the gold standard in your lab and make use this for your next generation product. But it's the same TiO2. So what what is what you know what's going on here? Okay. In order to be able to determine whether or not you have a pigment which will be able to give you high hiding power, you need very very basically three things. You need to be able to know what the charge is on the titanium dioxide because opposite charges attract and you need enough charge to keep the pigment dispersed. But the charge varies as a function of pH, so you need a pH meter. And you use a rheometer to determine whether you have the dispersant properly applied. In other words, how, how liquid is it? And you also need a particle size analyzer. Now, when we look at TiO2, you'll find out that even the exterior grade, semi-durable or durable products all have different levels of alumina and silica and zirconia at different percentages. And you say, whoa, you know, do I have to use different dispersants for each of these? Well, fortunately, there has been a process of natural selection that the dispersants were made for the TiO2. The TiO2 was made to be compatible with the resins. The resins were modified to be compatible with the TiO2. And this whole process goes back and forth until you optimize for somebody's dispersant and somebody's resin. So, the isoelectric point is the point of zero charge. And what happens is these particles are clumped together. You wind up with shaving cream. This is the danger zone. Where is the danger zone for your product? So if you're trying to disperse your product at an 8.5 pH with raw titanium dioxide, good luck. If you're dispersing it below nine, you're gonna have no problems. This one is the interior grade, the one with a nine pH IEP. So if we plot the charge of the product, remember now we're using a zeta potential instrument to be able to determine what is the charge. It's kind of like, what is the charge on my battery, okay? Well, titanium dioxide can carry a positive charge. If we take raw titanium dioxide and up the pH, it comes in at about eight. All commercial grades come in between eight, 8.5. I up the pH with dilute amino methyl propanol and that's AMP95. And then I lower the pH with nitric acid while measuring the charge. And at some point, it crosses over through a shaving cream phase, which you don't see because it's very dilute while you're doing the measurements. And it goes over to positive charge. But if I put a dispersant on it, I can keep that charge distinctly negative. So under typical paint making conditions, I'm in good shape, unless you're working with a haze thickener that's below 4.5, where you can get localized damage. So here's what you need for the optimization. I'm gonna skip over rheometers 
and go to particle size analyzers. <clears throat> we can take the Hariba 950 and I can take my iPhone and do a video tracking of the particle size growth. And this was an experiment we were doing to make a composite. So we did a blend. The titanium dioxide was coated with calcium carbonate, which was acting as a spacer. But you can only put a certain amount of it, up to maybe 15% to displace the TiO2. And what we were trying to do is make a composite. And we wanted to follow the particle size of the composite. So what is GSD? GSD of a 1.7 looks like this. A GSD of one would be a stick going straight up into there. So in other words, the square root of the D, uh, D85 divided by the D15 is one. The square root of one is one. So that is the ultimate. Nobody can make that, um, at least commercially. So at the zero minute mark, we're at, point, at 1.7, and then it starts growing in 11 minutes. And then at 45 minutes, the reaction, because we've added chemicals to purposely agglomerate it, is done. Now, this type of thing happens in paint making, and you don't realize it, and you can't track it. But you can if you have a hariba. So what you do is you add your pigment into the water, and then you add your resin to it and track it. And I like using the iPhone because I can zip forward or backwards with a little thumbnail on the bottom there, and I can watch it move. It moves like a, a, a blob. OK, so GSD. How do we keep it? Well, there's a flocculation that goes in the paint manufacturing process. And the two primary, one type of flocculation is purpose. We do an agglomeration by using inorganic chemicals to make composites, okay? Another type has to do the interaction with the polymers. So in that polymer formulation, there are rheology modifiers. There are resins. There are things that are floating around uh, that you purposely add to, uh, for example, if you want high open time, it is not uh, a low molecular weight material. It's actually a polymer that works best. The largest selling product is a product for open time and giving you a good wet edge that's based on polymers. And that was one of the problems that happened while converting to a all water-based system was how do I control open time? How do I get good touch up? Those are things that we're concerned. But you have to be concerned that these polymers you're adding don't act like stickies and hold things together. And there are ways to make sure that that doesn't happen. There's also another thing called depletion. And that's simply like walking through New York City. There's a big crowd. Everybody's bumping you in together with your little group. And your little group can't stay dispersed out in the, on the sidewalks. And they just get pushed in together because there are people bigger than you pushing you around. When you have depletion flocculation, you'll get lower gloss, lower contrast ratio, poorer film strength, and poorer adhesion. So there's some consequences as a result of doing that. Now, Roman Haas did an excellent presentation. Of course, they, had a, they were trying to sell associative thickeners, but they found out that you don't always get the ideal type of dispersion. And I have reference for this article here. But you see this guy right here, he's flying in the air with his, his new his, uh, foil sail. This is where you wanna be. So if you add too much dispersant with your pigment, let's say you have clay, calcium carbonate, you have uh, uh, all sorts of other mined minerals, and you just throw it into one batch, and you say, okay, eh, I'm gonna add 1% surfactant. Now, what happens? As you add your rheology modifier in there, you go into the depletion flocculation, flocculation zone. This black zone is what we call a big boulder. You don't wanna hit it. On the other side of the thing is if you don't have enough dispersant to keep the polymers from sticking to your TiO2, you'll get a bridging flocculation. So there is a sweet spot and you need to know where that sweet spot is. So there is one really interesting thing. That exterior TiO2, as you increase the concentration of dispersant, actually has a higher affinity for a hydrophobic dispersion. And you can get a lot of hydrophobic material on an exterior grade TiO2. Why is that? And this is something that I found was so interesting. I developed a co-dispersant. 
and what is called a micro co-dispersant. You add it in parts per million to the existing formulations and you can get super high grind solids. So let's find out what happens when we, when we do add these uh, micro dispersants. If we take a standard titanium dioxide commercial slurry and we run the particle size distribution as a function of pH, we can see that it's a 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.45. And somebody's gonna say, well, wait a minute, Glenn, you told me that the ideal particle size is 0.35. Well, that depends on the pH, it depends on the dispersion, depends on whether you sonicate the sample, depends whether you were working with dry product. Now, if you work with dry product and slurry it yourself, you'll find that the particle size distribution will not be, or the, the average particle size distribution will change according to what dispersant and how you grind it. So we took another commercial product and we checked its particle size distribution and it didn't matter whether you had the co-dispersant or not. Um, now, how am I getting these GSDs? Again, we go to the Hariba, remember those curves that showed how they were growing and expanding. It's the width of the curve that kills you, okay? The average particle size looks pretty good. And it really didn't matter whether you used a, 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 a co-dispersant or not until you go to look at the GSD. Now, this product from company A, which was not modified in any way, has pretty good GSD, uh, pretty good um, yeah, GSD. Now, what is good, better, best? That's a good question. Horrible is 1.6. Good is 1.5. Best is less than 1.4. So if you can keep that distribution tight and you see my guy flying here, how do I make a high hiding power product? You've got to make sure that the GSD remains stable over the pH range with all the pH additives that you use for making your paint. And so what we find here is that if we can grind at 83% solids, and then we let it down from there using a co-dispersant, a micro co-dispersant added in parts per million, we can do a fantastic job of stabilizing this and giving a great GSD over a broad pH range. Now this translates to a 10% reduction in the amount of TiO2 that you need for high hiding power. And so we would say, okay, here's two commercial grades. If we happen to be making paint at 8.5, they would look the same. So it didn't matter whether you went to A or B, you're living in the world of the blind and the one-eyed king reigns. And so nobody knows any different. This is the best right here but it changes according to pH and you have control over that with the particle size analyzer. Okay, so the requirements. What you need to do is you need to minimize the amount of thickeners and surfactants. And I alluded to the fact that you could grind at 83% solids and then you can let it down to 79% solids and that would be at 380 to 480 centipoles. The test of your TiO2 and whether you have the right dispersant is to put it in water and test whether or not you can dump all of the pigment in and in less than one minute without clumping, without losing your vortex, can you grind at 83% solids? And you have exactly one minute to do it. So you take 700 grams of pigment, weigh out your water, put in your dispersant, and if you cannot add and suck that pigment in like it just rocks falling into water, you do not have the right surfactant, the right dispersant that you need. Now, why do we want to go for very high solids? It's because the resins come in with a lot of water. If you have a lot of water, the big headache in 2010 was, oh my God, I, I can't get my KUs. Oh, I can't get my ICIs. How am I going to thicken this product up? And fortunately, some great companies came along and developed products that thicken, but it didn't take into consideration whether or not I'm causing a depletion type uh, thick uh, TiO2 agglomerating. So then you find problems with rub-ups and there's gonna be a lot of benchtop chemists sitting there 
look at, yep, I know what you're saying, Glenn. We got it thick, but doggone it, when you went to do a touch up, we got different color paints. So you want to target all your fillers. If you have a filler that doesn't give you 70% solids as a starting point, don't use it. Look for something different because these thickeners are the bad boys. The more you put in there, the more they're going to cause a flocculation. Now, the other thing is what sort of slurry properties you want. So here's where the Hariba comes in. You want a small particle size versus pH. How are you going to measure it with particle size? I want a narrow particle size distribution versus pH. How are you going to measure it? Hariba. I want zeta potential versus pH. Why? Because if I try to do my dispersion and it's a positive charged product and I've got negative charged resin, it's not going to work. I want high solids. And by breaking particles down into the smallest form prior to, to, to making your paint, you are going to have the best possible paint. Finally, you can do compatibility tests. You can watch live. In fact, uh, trying to get people to convince Say at the time the machines were running $100,000 at the time and they'd come down a lot. So sitting there with the vice president of R&D and the vice president of manufacturing in a lab and I, they said, why should we buy this instrument? And what I did was I took the resin that they were currently adding. I set my refractive index to monitor the titanium dioxide and what they saw was very similar to what you saw while making a composite. Right before their eyes, they could see the resin growing the titanium dioxide. And then I said, now here's how we're going to calculate how much you're going to save. I want you to think about how much extra TiO2 you have to add at the end of the batch to hit your uh, opacity, your hiding power. And that is exactly what's wrong with your whole manufacturing process. It's how you add the surfactants. It's where you add it. It's the pH, it's the concentration. Are you using micro co-dispersants that will just zip the pigment into the water? So having had that as a tool, they also were able to use the Hariba to develop a fingerprint. They set it on the refractive index of the TiO2, and then they could see all the peaks of all the other particles they had, and they could tell whether a paint was good or not, and the formulation was followed by looking at the peaks and the intensity of the peak. So we've got three applications. And I'll tell you, this instrument paid for itself in three months. They were able to throw out the resin supplier. They were able to look at the titanium dioxide supplier. And fortunately, company B, who had the gold standard, did something wonderful. They changed the way they put the alumina down on the surface. They came from the acid side whereas everybody's coming from the alkaline side. And they did an excellent job of giving a surface which was amenable to dispersing with the hydrophobic co-dispersant. Okay, so having said that, I'll turn it over to questions. Thank you so much um, for the excellent presentation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read these questions to you, Glenn. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, so does TiO2 particle size determine its end use applications? And part two of that question is, how is TiO2 particle size determined for different applications? Okay, so in the paint industry, the particle size distribution or the particle size is um, generally the raw product itself, the titanium dioxide particle before it is wet treated is a quarter micron. And they go, they have instruments in the field, they have instruments in their QC lab, they pay huge amounts of money to their researchers to make sure that you keep this particle size at a quarter micron. Now, the particle as it's coming out is actually not quarter micron. It is depending on the manufacturer. And we're talking about particle size. I can tell where the titanium dioxide is made, whether it's sulfate, whether it's chloride whether it's chloride low pressure, high pressure, whether the wet treatment process was a batch process or a continuous process by just looking at scanning electron micrographs. And you do not find nice round particles. In fact, low pressure reactors make linear. They look like a choo-choo train, quarter micron particles that are stuck together. If you look at some of the other plants, they make some that look like balls of TiO2, 
Some of the ones that come out of sulfate processes have huge clumps of small quarter micron particles and 0.1 micron particles. The size of the particle is, in general, the factor that gives you the high hiding power. And as I said earlier, if you have particles that are less than 0.1 micron, it's useless. It is not going to give you hiding power. If you have particles greater than 0.5 micron, it's not doing as much for you as if you are at the quarter micron particle size. So you'll see the data published at 0.35 microns, some at 0.4, and this has to do with what's wet treated. Is it during the wet treatment process, how much coating do they have down on the surface? So you customize the TiO2 according to what formulation you want. In the plastics industry, they will choose a product which is slightly bigger than 0.35 microns because they want a yellowish white tint to it. In some cases, they want a bluish white. In the paper industry, they absolutely have to have a blue white tint to it. Why? Because the human eye perceives the blue in the spectrum as being whiter. And yellow is nasty. They detect things that look yellow that says this does not look like a good paper. And in paper industry, it's all about having a bright white product. The answer to the question is yes, the size of the particle determines the shade, whether you're gonna get a slightly blue tint or a yellow tint. And how you make it in the paint formulation determines whether you're gonna have touch up problems, rub up problems, whether or not you're gonna have uh, incompatibilities with the uh, colorants that you have. So these, the size of the particle also determines how much surfactant or how much dispersant is on the surface. Now, if you're buying a slurried product, a pre-slurried product, you have the advantage of knowing that although it has a quarter percent as a rule of thumb of dispersant, up to 0.3%, only half of that is actually on the surface of the product in equilibrium. So when you do your particle size analysis, it's a good idea to centrifuge the water and use that as the makeup that you're going to for doing your TI2 analysis because you then have the equilibrium of the dispersant already set. Thank you, Glenn. So that kind of leads us to the next question. What is the typical size of TIO2 required for paint formulation? So there, there again, uh, if you go back, here's the commercial stuff right here. Median particle size, the D50. It's based on volume, not based on number. You can make a pretty good paint from slurry yourself if you have something that's at 0.45. Um, if you want to get the maximum hiding power out of your product, you're going to be looking to try and push it down towards 0.35 by the Hariba analysis. Okay, now that is a light diffraction method. There are three wavelengths that are used, so it has very good broad spectrum. I love the optical set that they have. Gosh, since the 1990s, I've looked at these instruments and still they have a stable optical set. The most expensive thing you're going to find to replace in your instrument is the optical set. And I can tell you that I have not seen one of them, and I think you will confirm this based on your repair reports, that you don't have anybody ever coming back and saying, I need a whole new set of laser lights, right? So Correct. This, this, there you go. So, so I, now there's another reason why you need a very stable optical set, because if you were trying to determine whether or not your grinding gave you a 10% improvement of knocking down a 0.5 micron particle, and you go day to day, year to year, doing this analysis, I can assure you that other instruments are very sensitive to the solids content. And what I do is always make sure that I make it up to the same parts per million, the same solids content every time so that that laser is dead on. The machine will do it automatically, but I prefer zeroing it in within a specific range uh, that the machine tells me. Thank you. So the next question, instead of adding dispersant, some people do polymer coating on TiO2 surface, um, surface activated alumina or silica for better dispersity. So which one is better in your opinion? 
Okay, so if you use silicas to disperse your products, you're talking about silicate paints. The silicate paints have been around in Germany for years and years. And you want to talk about something that has no VOC? The only thing that carries it is the small amount of latex resins that they add, and that's changing also. So that is the very high pH end. You're talking about nine or higher pH range. There is the tendency of the TiO2 to want to be positive charge, particularly if you're putting an alumina treatment and all the pigments, I don't care whether it's Chinese, American, from Australia, wherever it's made, they all have alumina on the surface. The TiO2 is crying to please let me be positive charge. And so as a result of that, you can enhance that positive charge by using soluble alumina chemicals. And there's something specifically called a Keegan ion, which you can use to supercharge. It's like taking high octane fuel and putting it into your car. It's gonna give you that jet fuel. It's gonna give you that extra positive charge kick. And now what you can do is you can get, as long as you're above plus 40 on your zeta potential, you can now mix it with one of the four brand new, well, one has been around since 2010, the others have been a couple of years or so, but at Western Coating Symposium, cationic resins dominate. They give you high hiding power. You can disperse the pigment directly into the resin without having to add any dispersant at all. And they give you stain block and they dry to complete cure in 15 minutes. So I'm saying the guy riding that board over there is definitely on the way. And the other good thing is, is that the coronavirus cannot survive on a positive charge surface. The preliminary studies were done on the, where does this virus like to live? Steel lives long, long time. Plastic, long, long time. Copper dies, that makes sense. You can pick up some soluble copper. Paper dies pretty quickly, why? Because all unbleached paper is made with alumina chemistry. And the second part to that question is, does the shape matter? If we're able to make spherical TiO2, does that help to increase the hiding power? Okay, so the reason, if you look at the best scanning electron micrograph of TiO2, it looks kind of like it has rounded edges, but that's an electronic illusion. The best way to think of it is it looks more like the Washington Monument. There are very sharp edges on that TiO2 particle. And the titanium dioxide rutile product actually has three refractive indices. And you have to use a mathematical the, a equation to calculate out what the average refractive index. Whereas anatase products have the same refractive index no matter what light comes in, no matter what side uh, it comes in. It looks like a, a dumpy short Washington monument. So these particles are not round. Get it out of your head. Titanium dioxide is not round. Titanium dioxide is a clear crystal. They are twins. They're stuck together like choo-choo trains. The high pressure reactors tend to put out balls of titanium dioxide and the manufacturers have to be very careful about how they do the heat transfer, how they do the turbulence, what kind of co-additives they have to put in the oxidate to control the particle size to keep it small. But the particle size analysis, if you took a low pressure reactor, you can determine that it has a 0.3 micron if you take a high pressure reactor, you'll see that it has 0.35 micron. You can adjust your reactor on high pressure to be the same as a low pressure reactor, but the particle is totally different. And so what happens is, and I used to argue that I like the linear one because at least on the cross section, on a X, Y axis, the X and Y, you've got quarter micron. On the Z axis, you might have five particles stuck together. And you can go crazy trying to do computer analysis, determining what is the actual crystal size and so on. And please don't waste your time. Because of the randomness of how the particles are oriented in there, it makes no difference. It's the cross-sectional availability that's important. Air is extremely important. If you wanna do air hiding, what is the cheapest type of opacity? I start my course on 101. What is the cheapest type of opacity? What is the lowest cost, highest hiding 
type of coating that you can put down? And the answer is a head of beer. And the reason why is because it has very high air interface and it has a lot of film. But of course, you can't make a coating out of that. So the objective is, and this is the guy who's flying around with that special high technology resin TiO2, we need to stop the actual capillary forces in the film as it's forming. And in order to do that, you have to change the chemistry of the resin itself. I can take a TiO2 coated material, make it hydrophilic, hydrophobic, it's the type of TiO2 in the coating, and then just dry it. And you'll sit there and you'll see that the, the level didn't shrink. It stayed where it's at. And that's going to give you the highest bulk volume. Now, there's something called PVC, uh, pigment volume concentration. And that is that the more you crowd the TiO2 together, the lower the hiding power because they begin to touch each other. Pigment particles, titanium dioxide that touches each other, ends the game for uh, hiding power. So it's not only the size, but it's what's happening during the drying process that affects your hiding power. Thank you. And then someone commented to the previous question that the stability of the laser comes from the fact that it's a, a laser diode instead of a helium neon. Um, and I'm also going to send the link to the chat box right now um, since someone asked about the LA, the next generation LA960 and where to register for the new webinar. Okay. Um, I do want to honor your time. So we got two more questions. One is, does TiO2 for sunscreen require the same size for paint? Um, both applications are for hiding surfaces behind the coating. Okay, so TiO2 for sunscreen, the particle size of that TiO2 is below at or below 0.1 micron. And people just don't like to walk around on the beach looking like a painted clown. So you purposely make the TiO2 small so that it is transparent and the light is not bending. The problem is, is that the smaller you make the TiO2, the higher the surface area. The higher the surface area, although it is absorbing the light, the UV light, you have to say, well, where does that UV light go? If, it, if you don't burn, where is it going? And the answer is it's absorbed. And what it does is it plays around with the electrons. It absorbs and makes it photoreactive. So some of the better grades of the sunscreen versions actually have a coating on the surface, not only to provide dispersion in water-based formulas, but it also, and you really don't care about durability outside. The problem with something that is smaller, what we call the nanoparticles, is the problem that you have with COVID. What happens is, is the particle size is what determines how deep it penetrates into your lung to get into the alveoli of the lung. So the COVID virus is beautifully engineered to write on 0.1 micron to one micron aerosols. And if you wanna see a really scary picture, I'll just pass this on so you all are living in the next couple of years, go to NHK aerosol, look that up for the COVID. Now, the TiO2 actually shares something with the virus. The TiO2 is a quarter micron in size. And in the studies that were done on rats, if you're working with powders, it will go into the alveoli and pack in there. And if you do enough packing of pigment and breathe enough of this stuff, then you will wind up with cancer. And that's probably that's something that's not advertised too well, but it's not an issue with paints. It's tied up in resins and plastics and so on. Nobody packs pigment for the rest of their life unless you work at a TiO2 plant. But this is what the magic of how you penetrate deep into the lung. And the N95 mask is the only thing that stops it. Don't let anybody tell you. Don't any of these fashion design things work for you. I've worked with sulfuric acid mists that would eat your lung up in a minute. And the reason why the N95 works, diverging from the subject for a second, is that even though it's only 95% efficient at pulling out the particles, the particles have to go through the mask with brownian motion, which means slow, don't exercise with your mask, don't give high velocity winds, and allow it to just kind of meander and stick like a fog hovering over the surface. 
when you look at that NHK video and see exactly how long that mist stays in there, what 0.1 micron and less does, you can only see it with lasers. You're gonna say, I am forever committed to wearing an N95 mask. It has the right uh, static charge and everything to pull it out. Sorry to divert, but I needed that to say that to help you guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and the last question is for a, and I'll just read it as is, um, for a 38 VS solids, 20 PVC TiO2 semi-gloss paint, what is the best uh, contrast ratio I can get with a three mil bird bar, assuming a 94 whiteness paint? This is a very specific question. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh -oh. Well, I, I hate to say it depends, but it does. It really does depend. The best contrast ratio that you're going to get using the existing water-based technology, the resins, that is your resins are starting out at 0.1 micron and you're using Hewer thickeners, which are kind of like the big bulky monsters that float around. But if you don't use too much of it, you'll be in good shape. If you start with a high solids filler and the one that i recommend is aluminum trihydrate which is kind of unusual it's more expensive but you would be able to get a, a 0.99 on contrast ratio so that's about as good as it get for a three mil awesome okay so we're 10 minutes over um is there anything else that you would like to add before we conclude the webinar so what I would highly recommend that, that you do is from all of your TiO2 suppliers, request a zeta potential curve as a function, look at it as a function of pH and have them specify for you, how did you bring the pH up? I recommend AMP 95. Uh, if you ever do a Google search on micro dispersant, you will see that Angus chemical, which was Dow, which is the kind of the standard because it gives dispersion, you can find that uh, as a chapter in a book and does a very good explanation of why uh, an 89 molecular weight product would give you any dispersion. But it's the one that for raising pH does the least damage. And so you'd start up with a high pH, no higher than nine, and then you start lowering the, the uh, and I recommend nitric acid, but if they use something else, that's fine. And that way, if you have them use the same acid amongst all the suppliers and all of them have a zeta potential meter and they're able to determine the charge as a function of pH. Once you have that in hand, you can then start thinking about, okay, is this the titanium dioxide that I want to make a cationic paint out of? And let's go really wild out there, okay? How do I know that that cationic paint has a good GSD? That's where you're going to need a particle size analyzer. So there are some paint companies that have particle size analyzers. There are some that have very stable, you can take the TiO2 independent of concentration and determine from day one to 20 years from now, and you'll have the same GSD, same particle size distribution. You take that and you determine whether the additives, the rheology modifiers, the resin itself is increasing the particle size or decreasing the particle size. Um, some of the composites that you use, they're calcium based. You can't use that under acidic conditions the calcium carbonate disintegrates out, out of that process. Um, so when we, when we select a, uh, when, when we're making a paint formulation, it's all about particle size. If you have, if you are not measuring particle size, either of your resin, I can tell you right now that the second you measure the particle size of all your incoming shipments, you will never ever get a blend. You'll never get it. You know, if you want to, talk about resins, for example, resins have certain particle size. So it's not just for TiO2. And, and you watch the filters as it comes out, you see huge clumps of material coming in. How do you know that that resin isn't in interacting with your TiO2 and agglomerating that beautiful quarter micron, I say quarter micron cross-sectional because they're all grown in different ways, TiO2. So this is, you know, the value of, it's, it's kind of like, uh, driving and, and you're driving along, as long as I give you instructions, I can keep your windshield blind. 
If you live in the world of not knowing what your TiO2 particle size is, without knowing the exact chemical composition that's on the surface and the charges in it, without measuring it yourself, you are susceptible to get what we call floor sweepings. So every titanium dioxide manufacturer keeps a clean warehouse. Where does that TiO2 go? Where does it go? And if you are somebody who is not sophisticated enough to be able to measure it, it goes into your batch and you better ask for a price adjustment for that, okay? There's also bag filter material that agglomerates and in, in reaction bag material that picks up unreacted titanium tetrachloride. That's another disaster you can talk about. There's even, I've seen manufacturing operations as they're doing the grinding and they stop the grinder and they keep pumping in the grinding additive, the organic grinding additive on the, and it just fills up. And then are you going to get that batch? Probably, unless you're measuring particle size. You cannot make a high hiding particle, a high hiding particle paint without particle size. You need the pH, you need the rheology. The rheology is just like a thermometer. It tells you, oh my gosh, they've done something to the surface. The, there is a difference between a batch treated material and a, a continuous treated material. There is a difference in the crystallite size of the bomite. There's something called pseudo bomite on the surface. So you say, well, I'm measuring particle size. That's only 90% of the equation. The other 10% of the equation is, what are the size of these little crystals? Well, it turns out for tinting strength, if you happen to get a batch from a company that uses batch low pressure reactors, you're going to find your tint strength is 104, where you're used to seeing 100. Why is that? Because there is supposedly an interchangeability between these. And they're going to get all flustered and say, yeah, we've done the testing. We, we know that you know we're very consistent in all the product. I'm telling you, it just ain't so. And, and to be able to measure the crystallite size of these little mm -hmm. aluminum particles on the surface, it's not the amount, it's how well it's covered. Mm -hmm. And in ability applications, how, there, I could tell you how much silica is on the surface, but is that free silica floating around? Is that silica that's on the surface? Is it porous silica? So that's another question that pops up as well. So the, the answer to the question, you need somebody, my job is the visiting conductor who comes in. You have the excellent equipment, you have the excellent researchers, you have access to any resin you want, and I lay out the music sheet. And when you do that, you wind up being able to pay off your instrument in three months. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. For everyone else, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at um, labinfo at hariba.com if you have any more comments or questions that haven't been answered. Um, we welcome your feedback. For now, Thank you so much for your time today, Glenn, and everyone have a great day. We'll see you on October 6th for the LA 960 V2 uh, laser diffraction webinar. Thank you guys. Bye, Glenn. Goodbye.